In this video, we're going to cover DNA transcription. We're going to break down how the genetic information in a cell flows from DNA to RNA to protein. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the mechanisms by which cells copy DNA into RNA. Let's get started. The DNA inherited by an organism leads to specific traits by directing the synthesis of proteins. In the protein structure and function lecture, we covered how proteins are the cell's building blocks and they execute majority of the cell's functions. There are 20 different amino acids that are coded directly into an organism's DNA, each with different chemical properties. The 3D shape of a protein is specified by its unique amino acid sequence, and this sequence is determined by inherited genetic information. So the genetic instructions carried by DNA specify the amino acid sequence. This is called gene expression. The information encoded in a DNA sequence is converted into either a protein or just RNA. Let's look at the overview process. When a particular protein is needed by the cell, the nucleotide sequence of a gene, which is the basic unit of inheritance, it's the segment of DNA that contains instructions for making a particular protein, this segment of DNA is first copied into RNA, or ribonucleic acid, which is another type of nucleic acid. Okay, genes are the segments of DNA that are transcribed into RNA. And the RNA copies are then used to direct protein synthesis. Thousands of these conversions occur every second in each cell of your body. So the flow of genetic information is from DNA to RNA to protein. And all cells express their genetic information in this way. This is known as the central dogma of molecular biology, which was named by Francis Crick. There are two major steps in gene expressions that occur in all organisms, transcription and translation. Transcription is copying DNA into RNA, and translation is the synthesis of a polypeptide using the information in RNA, which we'll cover in the next lecture. Let's zoom out and look at this in a different way. Here's our cell and the nucleus. We start with DNA in the nucleus. DNA transcription takes place in the nucleus and we produce pre-mRNA. This pre-mRNA will then undergo RNA processing to become a fully functional mRNA. And then it gets exported to the cytosol where translation occurs. I just realized my ribosome and mRNA molecule look like a hot dog in a bun. How cute. This should help you remember it. A hot dog in a bun. Okay. So the first step is to copy the nucleotide sequence on a gene into RNA. So let's go through some of the important features of RNA. RNA is like DNA. It's a linear polymer made of four different nucleotide monomers or subunits, and it's linked together by phosphodiester bonds, but it's chemically different. In RNA, the nucleotides are ribonucleotides. The nucleotides contain the sugar ribose, hence the name ribonucleic acid. Whereas in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. And with the bases, RNA contains the base uracil instead of thymine, instead of the thymine found in DNA, as well as adenine, guanine, and cytosine. Uracil can also base pair with adenine, just like thymine can. So when it comes to DNA base pairing, it also applies to RNA. Now, when it comes to their overall structure, DNA is a double-stranded helix, whereas RNA is single-stranded. And because it's single-stranded, it can fold up into a variety of shapes, similar to how polypeptide chains folds up to form the final structure of a protein. The ability of RNA to fold up into a variety of structures allows RNA to carry out different functions in cells. It has structural, catalytic, or regulatory roles. It's not limited to just bridging the gap between DNA and protein, unlike with DNA, which functions as an information store. Okay? These are the major differences between DNA and RNA. Now, cells produce various types of RNA. The RNA molecules that are encoded by genes are called messenger RNAs or mRNAs. In eukaryotes, each mRNA typically carries information transcribed from just one gene, which codes for a single protein. There are also final products of some genes that are the RNA itself, and these non-coding RNAs have different structural, catalytic, or regulatory roles. When the final product of a gene is a protein, Gene expression includes both transcription and translation. 
but when an RNA molecule is the final product, translation is not needed, okay? That's RNA. Now, before we break down the three stages of transcription, let's go through the important molecular components first. So DNA transcription is quite similar to DNA replication. It begins with unwinding or opening a small section of the DNA double helix to expose the bases on each DNA strand. One of the strands will serve as a template for RNA synthesis, so similar to DNA replication. The RNA chain is determined by complementary base pairing with a DNA template strand, and the incoming ribonucleoside triphosphate is added one by one. It's covalently linked to the growing RNA chain. And this is done by the enzyme RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase unwinds the two strands of DNA apart and joins the RNA nucleotides together. Many molecules of RNA polymerase can transcribe the same gene at the same time. And just like DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases can only assemble polynucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction adding to the three prime end. Now, RNA polymerase can start an RNA chain without a primer, and they don't proofread their work, which isn't really a big deal because RNA is not used as the permanent genetic information storage, so mistakes in RNA transcripts have relatively minor consequences for a cell, okay? So how does RNA polymerase know where to start transcription? Let's go through this. To start transcription, RNA polymerase must be able to recognize the start of a gene so it can bind firmly to the DNA at this position. There are specific nucleotide sequences along the DNA that signal where transcription of a gene begins and where it ends. The DNA sequence, where RNA polymerase attaches and initiates transcription, is known as the promoter. Okay, now molecular biologists refers to the direction of transcription as downstream and then the other direction as upstream. And these terms are also used to describe the positions of nucleotide sequences within the DNA or RNA. So the promoter sequence is said to be upstream from the starting site of transcription. And the segment of DNA downstream from the promoter the segment being transcribed or copied into an RNA molecule is called a transcription unit or RNA transcript. Now, when it comes to the main enzyme involved, RNA polymerase, in bacteria, they have a single type of RNA polymerase that synthesizes mRNA and other types of RNA that function in gene expression, such as ribosomal RNA. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, have at least three types of RNA polymerase in their nuclei. One, two, and three. RNA polymerase two is the one used for pre-mRNA synthesis for all protein coding genes. Now going forward with transcription, there are three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. We're going to be focusing on eukaryotic transcription. So now let's subtract complexity and go through initiation. Okay. We mentioned before that the promoter sequence of a gene includes the transcription start point. So RNA polymerase binds to the promoter in a precise location and orientation on the promoter. This binding determines where transcription starts and the direction it will travel and which strand is used as a template. But the question is, how does the polymerase determine which of the two DNA strands to use as a template? Because each strand has a different nucleotide sequence. That's where the structure of the promoter comes in, because every promoter has a certain polarity. It contains two different nucleotide sequences arranged in a specific 5' prime to 3' prime order upstream of the start site. Recall that polymerase can only synthesize in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So once it's bound, it must use the DNA strand that is oriented in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction as its template. How beautiful is that? It just knows, okay? Now, before we can initiate RNA synthesis, Eukaryotic polymerases need some assistance. It requires a large set of accessory proteins called transcription factors. These proteins assemble on the promoter and help guide the binding of RNA polymerase. They position the RNA polymerase and unwind the DNA double helix to expose the template strand and the RNA polymerase can begin transcription. 
this whole complex of transcription factors and RNA polymerase bound to the promoter is called a transcription initiation complex, okay? Let's break this down further. A transcription factor binds to a short segment composed primarily of TNA nucleotides known as the TATA box. The TATA box is an important component of many promoters, located about 25 nucleotides upstream from the transcription start point. So once it's bound to the TATA box, other factors assemble along with the RNA polymerase II to form the transcription initiation complex. Once the RNA polymerase has been positioned, has been positioned correctly, the DNA double helix unwinds. And before RNA synthesis can begin, the polymerase must be released from the transcription factors. Okay? So once transcription has begun, these transcription factors will dissociate from the DNA and they'll be available to start another round of transcription with a new RNA polymerase. That's initiation. The next stage is elongation of the RNA strand. RNA polymerase will move along the DNA, unwinding the double helix and exposing the nucleotides. Polymerase adds nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing molecule. The RNA molecule peels away from the template strand and the DNA double helix reforms with the non-template strand. Okay, then the next stage is termination. In bacteria, there's a terminator sequence in the DNA. And once it's transcribed, the polymerase just detaches from the DNA and releases the transcript. Recall that bacteria lack a nucleus, so their DNA is already exposed to the cytosol, which contains the ribosomes on which protein synthesis can take place. Now in eukaryotes, RNA polymerase II is gonna transcribe a sequence of the DNA on the DNA called the polyadenylation signal sequence, which specifies a polyadenylation signal in the pre-mRNA. Once these six RNA nucleotides appear, they're bound by certain proteins in the nucleus. And then about 10 to 35 nucleotides downstream from the signal, these proteins cut the RNA transcript free from the polymerase enzyme, and we've released the pre-mRNA. The pre-mRNA will then undergo processing before it can be transported to the cytosol, okay? Let's take a breath for a second and slow it down. As I mentioned before, bacteria can just start translation or protein synthesis because their DNA is exposed to the cytosol already. In eukaryotes, DNA is enclosed within the nucleus, which is where transcription takes place. Translation, however, occurs on ribosomes that are located in the cytosol. So before mRNA can be translated into protein, it must be transported out of the nucleus. And before it can be exported to the cytosol, it must go through several RNA processing steps, which include capping, slicing, and polyadenylation. After these modifications, the mRNA molecule is ready for translation, okay? Before these steps are completed, the RNA transcript is known as a pre-mRNA or precursor mRNA. Let's go through this. During RNA processing, enzymes modify the two ends of the transcript, the pre-mRNA molecule. First is RNA capping, which modifies the five prime end of the RNA transcript. This is the part that is synthesized first. The RNA cap includes a guanine nucleotide, okay, with a methyl group, and it's attached to the five prime end. The second modification is called polyadenylation, Recall that pre-mRNA is cut and released soon after the polyadenylation signal is transcribed. At the 3' prime end, an enzyme adds 50 to 250 more adenine nucleotides, forming a poly-A tail. These two modifications have several key functions. First, they increase the stability of an mRNA molecule. They help protect the mRNA from degradation by hydrolytic enzymes. Second, they facilitate the export from the nucleus to the cytosol and marks the RNA molecule as an mRNA because before that, it's a pre-mRNA or precursor mRNA. And third, they're also used by the protein synthesis machinery. So they help ribosomes attach to the five prime end of the mRNA once it reaches the cytoplasm. Now capping and polyadenylation occur in all RNA transcripts, but most eukaryotic mRNAs have to undergo an additional processing step called RNA splicing before they become functional. Let's go through this. 
The sequence of DNA that codes for a polypeptide is not continuous. It's split into segments. Most protein coding genes have their coding sequences interrupted by long, by long non-coding sequences called introns. And the coding sequences are called exons because they are eventually expressed. So think exon to be expressed. Or you can think of exons as sequences of RNA that exit the nucleus. So the way you can remember between intron and exons, exon, exit, and express yourself, <laughs> okay? Both the terms exon and intron apply to both the DNA and RNA sequences. So when does RNA splicing begin? After capping and RNA polymerase II continues to transcribe the gene, RNA splicing begins. Introns are removed and the exons are stitched together. The addition of the poly -ale tail usually happens after splicing, but it can also occur before the final splicing reactions have been completed. Once an RNA transcript has been spliced and both ends have been modified, the RNA is now a functional mRNA molecule that can leave the nucleus and be translated into protein. Now, how is this pre-mRNA splicing carried out? Let's break this down. This is done by a large complex of proteins and small RNAs called the spliceosome. This complex binds to several short nucleotide sequences along an intron. So these small nuclear RNAs recognize splice site sequences through complementary base pairing between their RNA components and the sequences in the pre-mRNA, and they catalyze the splicing. The intron is then released and broken down, and then the spliceosome joins together the two exons. Some pre-mRNAs undergo alternative splicing to produce different mRNAs and proteins from the same genes. So we can produce many different proteins from the same gene simply by skipping some exons or including them, but their order cannot be rearranged. So gorgeous. That's why the presence of introns is important because even though they aren't expressed, they allow different proteins to be produced. So you may think something is wasteful and doesn't really serve a purpose, but if you zoom out, that very thing is important. Now quickly going back to the small RNA molecules in the spliceosome, RNA molecules that catalyze reactions like this are known as ribozymes. Just like proteins, RNAs can also act as catalysts, okay? So we've transcribed the gene, we've modified the ends, and splicing has occurred. What happens now? Where do we go from here? Only corrected processed mRNAs are exported to the cytosol, and it's mediated by nuclear pore complexes, which connects the nucleoplasm with the cytosol and act as a gate that control which molecules can enter or leave the nucleus. And the RNAs that aren't processed remain in the nucleus and are degraded there. And each mRNA molecule is eventually degraded in the cytosol. In the next lecture, we'll cover the second stage of gene expression, which is translation, and how we go from RNA to protein. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!